Welcome to the Institute of Catholic Culture, a nonprofit Catholic organization dedicated to the re-evangelization of our society through educational and cultural programs offered to the public at no charge. This and other presentations, hundreds of hours of audio, are available for free on our website, www.instituteofcatholicculture.org. There you can listen to or download educational programs related to all aspects of our divine faith, and you can review our schedule of upcoming events. We hope you can join us in person. Okay, our talk tonight is going to cover Genesis chapters 18 and 19. Genesis chapters 18 and 19. But before we get into that text, let's look at a little context. We're going to hear about Abraham, of course, but where did you first hear about Abraham? We heard it in chapter 11, first, the first mention of Abraham, but a narrative of Abraham begins in chapter 12 with the call of Abraham, right? You hear a little bit about Abraham and the genealogy there in chapter 11. So let's turn there for a second and remind ourselves of the context of the story of Abraham. Genesis chapter 12. Now the Lord said to Abram, Go forth from your country and your kindred and, to, and your father's house to the land that I will show you. And I will make of you a great nation and I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and, and him who curses you I will curse. And by you all the families of the earth shall bless themselves. We don't need to go into all the details. You've already covered this in previous talks. For those of you who are here new to the ICC, tonight is part of a series of talks on the book of Genesis. So then, turn with me to Hebrews chapter 11 to see how the New Testament sees the story of Abraham. Chapter 11 of the Epistle to the Hebrews. Chapter 11 of the Epistle to the Hebrews. One of my most favorite passages of the New Testament. Hebrews chapter 11. Now, faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. For by it the men of old received divine approval. By faith we understand that the world was created by the word of God, so that what was seen was made out of things which do not appear. By faith Abel offered to God a more acceptable sacrifice than Cain, through which he received approval as righteous, God bearing witness by accepting his gifts. He died, but through his faith he is still speaking. By faith Enoch was taken up so that he should not see death, and he was not found because God had taken him. Now before he was taken, he was attested as having pleased God, and without faith it is impossible to please him. For whoever would draw near to him near to God, must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. Verse 7, By faith Noah, being warned by God concerning events as yet unseen, took heed and constructed an ark for the saving of his household. By this he condemned the world and became an heir of the righteousness which comes by faith. Verse 8, By faith Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to a place which he was to receive an inheritance, and he went out not knowing where he was to go. No GPS. <laughs> That's an important verse, and we'll come back to that. Verse 9, By faith he sojourned in the land of promise, as in a foreign land, living in tents with Isaac and Jacob, heirs with him of the, play, of the same promise. For he looked forward to the city which has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. This is the heavenly Jerusalem, or the church. By faith, Sarah herself received power to conceive, even when she was past the age, since she considered him faithful who had promised. Therefore, from one man, and him as good as dead, and him as good as dead, were born descendants as many as the stars of heaven, and as innumerable as the grains of sand by the seashore. These all died in faith not having received what was promised, but having seen it and greeted it from afar, and having acknowledged that they were strangers and exiles on the earth. Having seen it and greeted it from afar. How did Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, how did they see 
the heavenly Jerusalem, the church. What is this author talking about? Turn with me over to John chapter 8. John chapter 8 for a second. You've heard this kind of language before. John chapter 8, verse 56. John chapter 8, verse 56. Your father Abraham rejoiced that he was to see my day. He saw it and was glad. How did he see his day? The Jews then said to him, You are not yet 50 years old. And have you seen Abraham? Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. Now, as some of you know from your study of the Gospel of John and other courses for the ICC, when Jesus says, I am in the Gospel of John, this is not simply him saying, I am this or that. This is a reference to Exodus chapter 3, verse 14. Right? Exodus chapter 3, verse 14, Moses says, But if I say to the Israelites uh, that I was sent and they ask your name, and he says, You tell them, I am who am. Right? In the Hebrew, Eche Asher Eche, I am who I am, or I, I will be who I am. You can translate it all sorts of different ways. Fortunately, we have the Septuagint, a Greek translation of the Hebrew, very precise uh, translation by Jews around 200 years before Christ, and they translate that phrase from the Hebrew into the Greek, ego imi ho'on, I am he who is, or the one who is, a statement of God's eternal existence. And there we find that phrase, ego imi. The ho'on, by the way, you also find in the iconographic tradition, in the halo, wherever you see a halo above Jesus' head, you see in the cross, Ho'on, he who is. Again, a reference back to Exodus chapter 3, verse 14. So when Jesus says this before Abraham was, I am, Abraham saw my day and he, re he rejoiced, he was glad. What does Jesus mean? Is he simply referring to his divinity? Well, I was there before Abraham was. Or does he mean something even more? Was he there with Abraham? Hmm. To answer that question, we have to go to the text. So now let's turn to Genesis chapter 18. Genesis chapter 18. And the Lord appeared to him by the oaks of Mamre. The Lord appeared to him, to Abraham, by the oaks of Mamre. Where are the oaks of Mamre? This is in Hebron. It's a Palestinian city in the West Bank. As he sat at the door of his tent in the heat of the day. Why is he in his tent in the heat of the day? What is he doing in his tent? Well, in this region, nomadic peoples are in their tents two times during the 24-hour cycle. Obviously in the evening, when it gets dark, they go to bed. But they also go to their tent when it's the hottest outside, in the middle of the day. They get up very early before the sun rises and begin to work outside when it's cool or relatively cool. And then when it gets too hot to work, 11 o'clock or so, they go into their tent, and they have a meal, and they sleep, and they wait until it begins to cool off, two, three, four o'clock, and they go out and they work again until it gets too, too dark to work. So he's in his tent in the heat of the day, and God comes to him. It says the Lord there. You see in all caps, if you have an RSV, many translations have the tradition of the translational tradition of putting all caps there, Lord. That indicates to you that in the Hebrew text, the divine name is there, Yahweh. Remember the divine name we talked about back in Exodus? In the Septuagint, you have Otheos, God. The same thing here. And God, or the Lord, appeared to him by the oaks of Mamre in Hebron as he sat at the door of his tent in the heat of the day. And he lifted up his eyes and he looked, and behold, three men stood in front of him. What? It says the Lord appeared to him, and now we hear about three men. When he saw them, plural, he ran from the tent door to meet them, plural, bowed himself to the earth and said, My Lord, singular, if I have found favor in your sight, do not pass by your servant. Let a little water be brought and wash your feet and rest yourselves, plural, under the tree. While I fetch a morsel of bread that you may refresh yourselves, plural, and after that you may pass on since you have come to your servant. So they, plural, said, Do as you have said. And Abraham hastened into the tent to Sarah and said, Make ready quickly three measures of fine meal, knead it, 
and make cakes. And Abraham ran to the herd and took a calf, tender and good, and gave it to the servant who hastened to prepare it. Then he took curds and milk and calf, which he had prepared, and set it before them. In the Hebrew, every one of these sentences or phrases is very, very short. It's intended to give you a sense as you're reading of the, the, the flurry of activity. And he stood by them under the tree while they ate it. Obviously standing as a servant, waiting to see if they need anything else. So a few questions. First of all, look at verse 8. Then he took curds and milk and a calf and he prepared it. And he set it before them. Anything strange about that? <laughs> right? In an Orthodox Jewish household, you have separate utensils. Some for dairy and some for not, right? You eat the, you have the meat utensils and plates and everything, and you have the dairy utensils and plates and different cabinets, lest the dairy, lest the milk might be mixed with the meat. Well, who cares, right? You have cheese on your burger. What's the big deal? Well, <laughs> I mean, it tastes good together. I mean, lebna on the lamb, you know. So why is that? Well, it goes back to the book of Exodus. In Exodus chapter 23, in Exodus chapter 23, and you don't have to turn there, God says to Moses, tell the people, do not boil a kid in its mother's milk. Well, what are we talking about? A kid goat or any of the offspring of the herd, the calf, the sheep, the, the kid goat, do not boil it in its mother's milk to eat it. Well, why would you do that? Well, remember, all religions in the end are trying to answer the questions of you know, the ultimate questions of why are we here, why do we die, what is the meaning of life, and how do I prolong it, right? How do I become immortal? That's really the essence of all the, you know, the questions that are behind all of the religions of, of history. And so in the pagan world, fertility cults and things having to do with life are a major, major focal point. And so an a animal that has just given birth Right? There's an image of new life. That little kid go to the land. This is like a little bundle of life hopping around. And the milk flowing, you know, the milk flows only when the female mammal gives birth. And so now you have liquid life with a little life thing hopping around. And if you could concentrate that somehow and consume it, maybe you could have the life of that animal. That's kind of weird. Well, it's paganism. Of course it's weird, okay? So, but that's what they did. And many of the laws in the Torah are designed like this. They're catechetical. They're intended to direct the people of Israel away from the pagan religions, away from the practices. This is why there are many things we do today that we're, they were not allowed to do in the Torah. Right? You like bacon? Right? Well, okay, so there are lots of things that we do that they couldn't do. Right? And we can't do that they did. It has to do with the culture and the history, okay? And mainly because of the pagan world that surrounded them. God was trying to keep them holy or set apart from the pagan world. So you do not do the, do the things which they do because that will lead you into the pagan religions. And before you know it, you'll be worshiping tree stumps like them. All right, now, that was Exodus 23, 19 for those of you who are interested. So the bigger question, though, beyond boiling kids in their mother's milk, is... Who are these people? We have Abraham. We have Sarah. We know that and the servants of Abraham. Fine. But the Lord appeared. And then we hear about three men. And we hear about singular and then plural back and forth. Any ideas? Trinity. Good guess. You got three. You have God appearing to Abraham. And so you might have a, a Trinitarian image there. The Trinity. What else? Uh, since it's the Old Testament, it could be angels. Why do you say that? Because it's the Old Testament, it could be angels. Well, because uh, the, the, I don't think that the Jews believed in the Trinity. Not just the Jews, the Israelites. Israelites. Okay. Well, you could say they, they believed in the Trinity, but they did not understand it in all of its revelation. They believed in God. Yeah. Right, but interesting point. All right, so... The Trinity, we have maybe some angels. What other ideas? Anything else? It says three men. Maybe some men. Anything else? Deacons, good. The bishop with his two deacons. I like that. Okay, so, 
All right, so then what's going on here? Obviously, it raises all sorts of questions and some very good answers and ideas here. Obviously, it seems like there's a Trinitarian image because there's the three. And so therefore, you do find, for the most part throughout Christian history, a meditation on that Trinitarian image of three. Sure. St. Augustine says that the, the image of the Trinity is impressed on all of creation. And so, sure, you could find in the Old Testament, maybe, some imagery that might lend itself in that direction. But, as was pointed out, I don't believe Israel was aware of the Trinity, maybe angels. What well, says the Lord appeared? So what's the answer? Well, in the earliest patristic commentaries on this passage, we find the commentators telling us that it is God appearing with his two angels with two angels. And this shouldn't surprise us where um, if you look in Genesis chapter 2 and 3, you, find, you hear about the Garden of Eden story and then of the unfortunate ending where man and woman leave the garden. And what guards the way to the tree of life? Yeah, the, the cherubim, right? Cherub is singular and cherubim, plural. The image is two of them guarding the two sides of the gate with the flaming sword in the middle. You're not getting past those guys. Right? So the, the gate is guarded by the two, the two angels. And you see the two cherubim, the guards of God's holiness. You find them also later on in salvation history in Exodus chapter 25. Remember when Moses builds the ark, he builds it according to the pattern he saw on the mountain. Well, the pattern he saw on the mountain was the heavenly temple. And he sees God enthroned on the Cherubim, right? And so he builds the ark as an image of that. You see it again also in, uh, in Ezekiel. Uh, he has the, sees the, cherub, the cherubic or the cherubic throne of, um, of God, Ezekiel chapter 1. So in the uh, patristic tradition, we find commentary that points to this being uh, God appearing with his two angels. As I told you, that makes sense looking at those other passages of the Old Testament. St. Ephraim the Syrian, the most important commentator on the book of Genesis among the fathers of the church. No debate about that. St. Ephraim the Syrian in his commentary on Genesis says, among the three, one was God. Now, in the iconographic tradition, we have the same thing. In the earliest forms of this icon, you see Abraham and Sarah, okay, and this is not the earliest one. This is just two different forms. I showed you just for simplicity here. Abraham and Sarah. This is the older form of the icon or of this image, okay? Form. This is not the actual oldest one. There were ones that are, you can barely see on, you know, old church walls and things like that. But in the earliest forms, you always find Abraham and Sarah somewhere in the story and an indication of the central figure as God. Often you'll find a cross in the halo Ho'on, because among the fathers of the church, you find many of them who see in the places where God appears in the Old Testament, the angel of the Lord appears and speaks in the first person as God, where God appears, the iconographer and the fathers of the church, they see that as a revelation of the pre-incarnate Christ. For an example of this, if you go into the baptistry before you leave this evening, there is an icon on the, in the baptistry wall of Moses striking the rock or the soldier opening the side of the Lord. Beautiful icon there. And you'll see above the, the rock, above the rock, you'll see an image of Christ. Because God said to Moses, go and strike the rock. I will stand there on the rock. So this is God, the image of God. You'll see that also in another icon of the three used in the fiery furnace. It says in the text that the Lord sent an angel if you look at the angel taking care of them, he has the cross in his halo. Later on in the iconographic tradition, because of the meditation of the Trinity, the idea of the three, you start to see this iconographic form morphing into a, more of a Trinitarian image. And then you come later to the period of Rublev, which is the, one, the form that most people are familiar with, Andrei Rublev's icon. Beautiful icon, of course. And by this time, by the time you get to the Middle Ages, the form has primarily been become an icon of the Trinity. But in the earliest form, consistent with the patristic tradition also, in the earlier patristic tradition, it is an image of God appearing with his two angels and then, of course, Abraham and Sarah. 
the form of the icon, the hospitality of Abraham, e philoxenia, philo, like Philadelphia, and xenos, foreigner, right? the hospitality, the love of the foreigner. So the icon of the Trinity, more traditionally, the, the icon of the hospitality of Abraham. Further evidence of that, uh, of, uh, confirming that interpretation of the text, is we find later on the story that Abraham remains with God when the two angels then go down to Sodom and Gomorrah. And then finally, of course, coming back to Bob's comment, and most importantly here, and that is, when was the Trinity revealed? Was the Trinity revealed in the Old Testament? No, you might find some shadowy images and things like that, but when was the Trinity revealed? At the baptism of Jesus in the Jordan. How do I know that? It's a nice guess, but the reason why I know that's an accurate interpretation, that that's the tradition of the church, is because that's what we sing in the liturgy. The liturgy enshrines for us the tradition of the church. The ancient liturgical hymns, I don't mean the modern ones that you might enjoy, but the ancient liturgical hymns that are required to be sung on certain liturgical feasts. All the apostolic churches have them, and they're relatively consistent. For example, in the Byzantine tradition, what do we sing on the feast of the baptism of our Lord in the Jordan? What is the Troparian? At your baptism in the Jordan, O Lord, the worship of the Trinity was revealed. So if you ever wonder, what is the tradition of the church on this passage? I wonder what the church understands us. What, what is this feast all about? Well, you don't have to guess. Sing the Trobarian. Sing the ancient liturgical hymn of that feast. And you will have, coming out of your mouth, the tradition of the church. The next passage, uh, verse 10. I'm sorry, here, not verse 10, uh, verse 9. And they said to him, Where is Sarah, your wife? And he said, She is in the tent. And the Lord said, I will surely return to you in the spring, and Sarah, your wife, shall have a son. And Sarah was listening at the tent door behind him. Now, Abraham and Sarah were old, advanced in years, and it had ceased to be with Sarah after the manner of the woman. So Sarah laughed to herself, saying, After I have grown old and my husband is old, shall I have pleasure? The Lord said to Abraham, why did Sarah laugh and say, shall I indeed bear a child now that I am old? Is anything too hard for the Lord? At the appointed time, I will return to you in the spring. Sarah shall have a son. But Sarah denied, saying, I did not laugh, for she was afraid. And he said, no, you laughed. <laughs> God will get the last laugh, of course. In chapter 21, we'll hear when she actually does give birth to her son. And she herself says, God has caused all to laugh with me or at me regarding the joy of giving birth to the child. All right, so then a few points here. First of all, where have you heard this story before about laughter and childbirth? And hmm, Zechariah and Elizabeth. Very similar story of old age. Very good. How about closer in the text, though, about laughter and a child being born? Abraham heard that Sarah would bear a child, and Abraham thinks, in my old age, and Sarah, ah, and he falls on the floor, on the ground, and it says, and he laughed. You talked about this. You heard about this in your last talk on the book of Genesis, I'm sure. So she laughs. You remember in your... Uh, in the lecture on Genesis 17, he laughs. Yitzhak in the Hebrew is the same as the name Isaac. Isaac is Yitzhak. He laughs, right? So there's a play also in this text on that idea, the name of the child, right? All right, uh, verse 16. Then the men set out from there, and they looked towards Sodom. So they set out from there, and they looked toward Sodom. Where are they? Most archaeologists believe that Sodom and Gomorrah were located somewhere in this region here, in the plain of the Jordan or the plain of the Dead Sea. Okay? There's a, a flatter area here. And, but anyway, uh, the, you have a flat area compared to the other side, a much more a larger flat area where you could have places, and you have wadis coming down where there's fresh water. 
And so there are lots of old settlements, old houses, old buildings, and old villages and things like that. Interesting, there are a few of them that they've dug up, and they were destroyed by fire from a, what appears to be a fire from the sky. Everything was consumed and burnt, and the sand on the layer of where it's burnt, the sand is turned to glass. That doesn't just happen from a typical house fire. And it's a lot of heat. Okay, so Abraham is up here somewhere in this region looking down into the Dead Sea area. And the Lord uh, said, verse 17, The Lord said, Shall I hide from Abraham what I'm about to do, seeing that Abraham shall become a great and mighty nation, and all the nations of the earth shall bless themselves by him? No, for I have chosen him, that he may charge his children and his household after him to keep the way of the Lord by doing righteousness and justice, so that the Lord may bring to Abraham what he has promised him. Then the Lord said, so you hear God deliberating with himself. Shall I tell Abraham what I'm about to do? This is a pretty horrific story. If I'm going to go down and destroy entire cities. Now you might think, well, why is God afraid? Or why does God not want to say this to him? Why is there this hesitation? Well, we'll see in the next episode. Abraham is very concerned about these very cities. So then the Lord said, because Abraham needs to be able to teach his descendants what they should and should not do, I better tell him what I'm about to do. Verse 20, Then the Lord said, Because the outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah is great, and their sin is very grave, I will go down to see whether they have done altogether according to the outcry which has come to me. And if not, I will know. Verse 22, So the men turned from there and went towards Sodom. But Abraham still stood before the Lord. You see now the separation. God is going to stay there, up on the mountain, up on the ridge there. And the two angels are going to go down to Sodom and Gomorrah, down into the valley. Okay? But Abraham remains with the Lord to talk to him about a few things. Verse 23, Then Abraham drew near and said, Wilt thou indeed destroy the righteous with the wicked? Suppose there were fifty righteous within the city. Wilt thou then destroy the place and not spare it for the fifty righteous who are in it? Abraham asked this question of God because he says, this isn't just that the, that the, the innocent would die with the wicked? And God says, if I find fifty righteous in the city, I'll spare the entire city for the sake of the fifty. So not only is God just, but incredibly merciful, right? And so Abraham says, well, what about 40? Well, yeah, for the sake of the 40. I'll spare them all. Well, how about 35? What about 30? Right? Finally, we come to the end of the bartering session, and it says, by the way, who is asking the questions here? Who's doing the bartering? Abraham. Abraham. And look what it says in verse 32. Then he said, oh, let not the Lord be angry, and I will speak again this once. Suppose 10 are found there. And he answered, for the sake of the ten, I will not destroy it. Verse 33, and the Lord went his way when he had finished speaking to Abraham. What do you think Abraham was going to ask next? Five? five? Just, I just have one more question, okay? I just want to know about the five, okay? And if you're going to answer the five, are you going to kill Lot? That's my question, okay? What if there's one guy... Poor Lot, he hasn't come home for Thanksgiving yet, and we're wondering are they, how many meals are we going to have to prepare? <laughs> All the fathers of the church, when they comment on this, again, comment on the love of Abraham, the hospitality of Abraham, the love of Abraham for his fellow man. You say, well, why would he care about these two cities? Sodom and Gomorrah? I mean, if I was Abraham, I'm up on there. I'm going to inherit all this land. So you're going to take those two out for me? Great. Why is he concerned? Love of fellow man, right? Love God and your neighbors yourself. We've seen him love God and now his neighbor as himself. Sure. What else might be at play here? Well, he did save all these guys in a battle just a few chapters earlier, right? And then finally... They were promised uh, to be his descendants and every blessing, right? These guys? Well, I thought, I thought that the Edomites... Oh, these aren't the Edomites. No. 
Oh, poor Esau. Don't attribute to Esau the, the Sodom and Gomorrah. So, Mary, you suggested it earlier. One other option? His nephew is there, right? What about Lot, right? So he's concerned possibly uh, for, in general, just for mankind. He's praying for man. He's interceding for, for sinful man. And also, why might he have a concern for these particular people? Possibly he did save all of them in a previous battle. He might you know, be hoping that they're going to turn around. And then also, in particular, his nephew is there. His nephew's... Lot, Lot's father's dead. Abraham is his father, right? Ab Abraham is his father, right? Okay, so God was with Abraham. He's up there. The two angels have gone down. And Lot was sitting in the gate of Sodom. What is Lot doing in Sodom? He's living there. Okay, why is he living there? We hear that Lot separated himself from Abraham. Why did he do that? They were quarreling over the herds, right? And those herdsmen were quarreling. Abraham, his uncle, says, Lot, we're brothers, right? We're relatives. Let's not quarrel. Let's not let our herdsmen quarrel. The land is broad. You go whichever way you want, and I'll go the other way. What does Lot do? What is he yearning for? He looks to the green grass on the other side, literally. And he says, hey, I like that. But what is he turning his back on when he walks in that direction? What is he leaving He's, he's leaving the real, the real green grass, the spiritual green grass. He's leaving Abraham, the mediator of the covenant, for green grass. Look where he ends up, right? A good lesson for us all and a good lesson for somebody else in the ancient world. Remember the book of Genesis, as you've heard in the previous lectures on the book of Genesis, in many ways catechizes the people of Israel. You can see it almost like a commentary on the book of Exodus. Where were the people tempted to go when everything's got rough and there wasn't enough green grass, enough food out in the wilderness? Back to Egypt and separate from Moses, right? Remember Numbers chapter 13 and 14, what happened, right? They chose, the spies went in and they didn't want to go. They said, no, we're not going to go in and we're not going to go into the promised land. And they died in the wilderness instead, right? Stick with the mediator of the covenant. Okay, now, so Lot went there for, he saw the material gain. He saw it as a place of prosperity. And of course, sure, there was lots of money, lots of, lots of green grass, lots of wealth. But of course, with it, there was lots of sin, right? Paganism. Why was Lot sitting in the gate of the city? Maybe, yeah. Some of the fathers say he was looking he was sitting in the gate to separate himself from the people a little bit. He couldn't stand the people of the city, the wicked sinners. And so he would stay at the gate to, to help visitors as they came, protect visitors who would be coming in in the evening to the gate to lodge there. He knew about this city and what they did to the visitors. So he's waiting at the gate like a great, uh, great host, like Abraham in the previous story, waiting to see guests coming in the distance as they come to the gate, and to quickly bring them to his house to protect them from the sinful men of the city. Also, uh, you'll find among the fathers and other commentators that Lot was looking out to the tent of Abraham, remembering where he had been and knowing now where he is, hoping someday to return. Either way, you see the hospitality of Lot emphasized in this narrative. 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 8. You can just make a note there. 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 8. St. Peter says that Lot was horrified. The righteous Lot was horrified by the sin of the city. He could not stand what was going on there. 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 8. So then, when Lot saw them, he rose to meet them and bowed himself his face to the earth and said, My lords, turn aside, I pray you, to your servant's house and spend the night and wash your feet. Then you may rise early and go on your way. You hear the story parallel to the previous chapter, right? And they say, no, 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 we will spend the night in the street. But he urged them strongly, and they turned aside to him. Right? If you ever come to uh, 
someone's house from the Middle East, right? And it's the exact same discussion. We have something to eat. No, no, no. Please, that's okay. Right? It's always the second time. So they sat down. They come into the house, and they're going to have a meal. They turned aside to him and entered his house, and he made them a feast and baked unleavened bread, and they ate. Verse 4, but before that they laid down, the men of the city, the men of Sodom, both young and old, all the people the last, to the last man surrounded the house, and they called to Lot, where are the men who came to you tonight? Bring them out that we may know them. Now what does it mean to know? Yada in the Hebrew means to know, right? to know something. But the first time you see this verb appear is... In chapter 4 of Genesis, and Adam knew his wife and she conceived. Obviously, we're talking about that kind of knowing here. Lot went out to the door to meet them, meet the men, and he shut the door after him. He said, I beg you, my brothers, do not act so wickedly. Behold, I have two daughters who have not known men. Let, them bring, let me bring them out to you that you may do to them as you please, only do not do anything to these men, for they have come under the shelter of my roof. But they said, Stand back. And they said, This fellow came to sojourn, and he would play the judge. Now we will deal worse with you than with them. Then they pressed hard against the man lot, and they drew near to break down the door. But the men put forth their hands, and the men, this is the angels, brought lot in, and they struck the blindness struck with blindness the men who were outside the door, both small and great, so they wearied themselves groping for the door. So, first of all, what does it mean to know? Obviously, we already discussed that. Why does he offer his daughters? Does this make you uncomfortable? So when you're reading the biblical text, remember the author of the text is a human being, the human author, right? And then you have the divine author, author the real author, right? Both are assuming you, the audience, are a human being and have a basic human conscience, okay? And have a basic sense of morality. So if you're uncomfortable as you're reading a story of the text, stop and look at it and say, why am I uncomfortable? It might be simply that you're not familiar with the culture or you're misunderstanding the text. In this situation, there's not much to misunderstand, okay? So you're <laughs> uncomfortable for sure for the right reason, okay? So why does he do that? Why does Lot do that? Hospitality, first of all, right? Well, it's showing forth, first of all, Lot's concern for these guests, right? You have the hospitality theme for sure. But wait a minute. What's another option? Did he have to do that? Right? There may be some other options he could have suggested, like maybe he could have drawn a sword and tried to kill these guys, fight them off. So there were some other options for sure. Obviously the theme of, of, um, of hospitality, and we want to be careful as we see this, this uh, character Lot, he obviously is not perfect, okay? But St. Peter refers to him as the righteous Lot. He was concerned about the sin in the city. Lot was a good man. St. John Chrysostom, I don't know of a, a, a moment when he mentions the name Lot that he doesn't say the righteous Lot, Only, always together, okay? So Lot was a good man. He may not have been perfect, and in this stressful situation came up with a plan that was probably not the best, but Lot was a good man. All right, verse 12 then. Then the men said to Lot, have you anyone else here? Sons-in-laws, daughters, daughters, or anyone you have in the city, bring them out of the place, for we are about to destroy this place, because the outcry against its people has become great before the Lord, and the Lord has sent us to destroy it. This is verse 14. So Lot went out and said to his sons-in-law, who were to marry his daughters, Get up, get out of this place, for the Lord is about to destroy the city. But he seemed to his sons-in-law to be jesting. In the Hebrew, it's that same word, the, the root for laughter. It might be a play there. But look at the contrast, the stark contrast of the two stories. God with his angels come to Abraham. They are welcomed. Abraham hurries to prepare everything, the best for God, right? The best for these guests. Look at the hospitality of Abraham. And what does he receive? A blessing, a promise of new life. When Abraham and Sarah are dead, basically, they're going to give birth to a son who will be the beginning of life for this new people, right? They're going to go from death to life because of the way they welcome to God. Look at the contrast here. 
Look at the welcome that this city has given these two angels. Start contrast, right? They are going to go from life and prosperity to death, right? Instantaneously. All right, then, verse 15. When morning dawned, the angels urged Lot, saying, Arise, take your wife and your two daughters who are here, lest you be consumed in the punishment of the city. But he lingered. So the men seized him and his wife and his two daughters by the hand, and the Lord being merciful to him. And they brought him forth and set him outside the city. And when they had brought him forth, they said, Flee for your life. Do not look back or stop anywhere in the valley. Flee to the hills, lest you be consumed. And Lot said to them, Oh, no, my lords. Behold, your servant has found favor in your sight. You have shown me great kindness in saving my life, but I cannot flee to the hills, lest the destruction overtake me and I die. Behold, that little city over there, it's just a little one. Can I just go there? Let me escape there. It is just a little one, and my life will be saved. And he said to him, Behold, I grant you this favor also. Also, that I will not overthrow the city of which you have spoken. Make haste, escape there, for I can do nothing till you arrive there. Therefore, the name of the little city was called Zoar, which means little one. And the sun had risen on the earth when Lot came to little one, to Zoar. Again, this is one of, there's different uh, cities all along here, ancient city sites. And so they've figured out which ones they think are them. In fact, I, on one of the slides, I had the archaeological map. There you go. Uh, so here is what they believe is Zoar. Here is what is, some think is Gomorrah. And here is what some think is Sodom. But these are archaeological guesses. Verse 24, Then the Lord rained on Sodom and Gomorrah brimstone and fire from the Lord out of heaven. And he overthrew those cities and all the valley and all the inhabitants of the cities and what grew on the ground. But Lot's wife behind him looked back, and she became a pillar of salt. And Abraham went early in the morning to the place where he had stood before the Lord. So he's on the edge of that ridge there looking down into the, the valley of the Dead Sea. And it says, uh, verse 27, Abraham went early in the morning in the place where he had stood before the Lord, verse 28, and he looked down toward Sodom and Gomorrah and toward all the land of the valley and beheld, and lo, the smoke of the land went up like the smoke of a furnace. So she looked back and she turned into a pillar of salt. And what happened to the city? God rained down, it says, fire and brimstone doesn't happen every day. So what happened? Well, lots of different ideas. Uh, the best guesses uh, are that there was some sort of an earthquake. You know, the, um, uh, the, this, is all, this is not only called the Dead Sea or the Salt Sea, but it's also called, in Greek, the Sea of Asphalt. Asphaltitis. The Sea of Asphalt. Uh, it has, and still today, bits of bitumen float to the surface and you can find it on the sand on the Dead Sea there. Okay? It's uh, basically kind of like the closest thing you'd imagine for what we have is coal, bits of, of, um, of petroleum, okay? petrified petroleum stuff, uh, which burns, of course, as you know. And so the theory is, because there is a fault line that goes through this area, that with an earthquake, a sudden earthquake, you might have had a release of petroleum gases, sulfur gas, and bits of bitumen flying up into the air, and with the local fires, or maybe fire from something like that, that you have a sudden destruction. Now you might say, well, are you saying this was a natural event? Well, I don't know. God can use all sorts of events to do whatever he wants, right? So there might have been some sort of natural uh, elements in the area that God uses to bring this about. Obviously, this is the hand of God causing this to happen at this moment and in this way. So then, do not turn back lest you be consumed. And what happens to Lot's wife? She turns back. Why does she turn back? <laughs> she was a woman. I didn't say that. <laughs> why, why did she turn back? Right? Now, this story happened. She obviously turned back. She looked. She yearned from the place from which she had come. 
This is her home or somewhere in that region. She looks back from the place from which she came, right? The place of sin. God was saving Lot and his wife and the two girls from a horrible place of paganism, sin, darkness, and bringing them forth out of there to come back to the company of Abraham, to the place of light. Who else, of course, might this comment upon? Well, of course, the people of Israel who have come out of Egypt. We already saw a comparison of Sodom and Egypt in the book. They've come out of Egypt, right? By the way, if you want a reference to the, to the bitumen and the tar, or the, the coal in the region, if you just make a note for yourself there, uh, back to Genesis 14 is the first occurrence of the word Sodom. In Genesis 14, you remember the battle and they got their chariots got caught in the bitumen pits, it says? Right? And again, even today, you can go there and you can find the stuff. There's sulfur, uh, and sulfur rocks, and also, um, and also the bitumen. So then, what lesson might Israel gather from this? Or what lesson might we gather from this? Right? Do not linger in the place of sin. Do not look back when God is bringing you forth. Right? That's the temptation of the new convert from, uh, from darkness and paganism after they come through the baptismal font, after they cross the Red Sea, as it were, to look back to Egypt and want to return. Verse 30, uh, verse 29, sorry. So it was that when God destroyed the cities of the valley, God remembered Abraham. Remembered Abraham. Remembered Abraham? Well, Abraham wasn't there. Look at that. That's a mistake in the text. I should say remembered Lot. No. Remembered Abraham and sent Lot out of the midst of the overthrow when he overthrew the cities in which Lot dwelt. Why does it say he remembered Abraham? The covenant, right? Whenever you hear God remembers, right? And God remembered Noah in the ark. It wasn't that God had forgotten. Where was that? There was that boat down there somewhere. No, he remembered <laughs> Noah. He kept the covenant, his promise to keep Noah alive, right? He kept his promise. He remembered and so here also, God remembers Abraham. God has a covenant with Abraham, and Lot is attached to Abraham. And so God remembers Lot, right? He remembers Abraham and sends Lot forth. Remember that conversation, the bartering earlier, right? Abraham didn't get the answer. But with eyes of faith, he knew what the answer was, right? If God would save the city for 50 righteous, if God would save the city for 40, for even 10 righteous, he'd preserve the whole city. Would he not preserve the city if there was one? Right? Don't you know, Abraham, that, you, that God is concerned for Lot way more than you are? And then finally, we come to the last episode, verse 30. Now Lot went up out of Zoar and dwelt in the hills with his two daughters, for he was afraid to dwell in Zoar. I would be too, if you saw what happened in the neighboring cities. So he dwelt in a cave with his two daughters. And, again, the cave. This is in the previous, uh, no, not that one. Here, okay. So you've got the, the mountains rise up quickly here. This is all cliff face here. So he went up there into a cave and dwelt there with his two daughters. Verse 31, And the firstborn said to the two daughters, our father is old, and there is not a man on earth to come into us after the manner of all the earth. Come, let us make our father drink wine, and we will lie with him, that we may preserve offspring through our father. So they made their father drink wine that night, and the firstborn went in and lay with her father. And he did not know when she lay down or when she arose. And on the next day, the firstborn said to the younger, Behold, I lay last night with my father, and let us make him drink wine tonight also. Then you may go in and lie with him, that we may preserve offspring through our father." So they made their father drink wine that night, and also and the younger arose and lay with him, and he did not know when she lay down or when she arose. Again, the fathers of the church comment on that very verse there that Lot was unaware of what was going on here. Right? So does that make you uncomfortable? Does it look a little strange? <laughs> now, if you hadn't paid attention earlier in the story, when Lot said, well, I have these two daughters, um, take them, right? How could a father do that? His two girls and the, 
and with this aspect of them, and then look what they then do to him, right? Now, again, you could read this in a very positive way, and that is that, well, they thought that the, you know, there was no more life on earth, and this was the only chance. Furthermore, uh, you've got to put yourself in the cultural, cultural context. Incest or consanguinity issues like this are not outlawed by the Torah until we get to the Torah, until you get to Leviticus 18. Leviticus 18, that's 500 years from now, right, from this point, okay? So you go back, you rewind, you say, okay, well, maybe, you know, our cons consanguinity issues and incest issues are formed from the Judeo-Christian tradition going back to Leviticus 18. And so something that we might be squeamish about, well, it might not have been so squeamish to them. So again, putting yourself in the historical context is extremely important. But what does the story, how does the story portray this event for us? How does the story, how does the author comment on this? In a positive or negative way? Well, in a relatively negative way. It says in uh, verse 36, verse 36, Thus both the daughters of Lot were with child by their father, the firstborn, bore a son and called his name Moab, from the father, literally what it means. He is the father of the Moabites. Dum, da, dum, dum, dum. The daughter, or the younger, also bore a son and called his name Ben Ami, son of my people. Literally, he is the father of the Ammonites. Now, if you're an Israelite, you like those names, Ammonite, Moabite, make it comfortable. No. So then. The Moabites, the Ammonites. Oh, I don't like those guys. Right? These are the guys you're going to have to deal with when you come out of the 40 years of wandering and you head up into the Promised Land. The Moabites, the Ammonites, the enemies of Israel, wicked peoples. And so therefore, how does the text, what is the text telling us there then? What has happened to Lot and his descendants? They become the enemies of of the people of God. He looked first to the green grass on the other side, right? He went after material comfort and wealth rather than hanging out in some arid land with Abraham and look where he ended up. Look where his descendants ended up. Had he stayed with Abraham and told his herdsmen, hey, get along with my uncle's herdsmen, things would have been different for Lot. Lot and his descendants would have been part of the people of Israel and we wouldn't know about the Moabites and the Ammonites. Okay, so finally, to conclude then, what's the purpose of the story? Why do we have this story preserved for us in the text? I already mentioned for you that it is catechetical. The story happened, right? But we're told this story, it's preserved in the history of Israel for a reason, for the people of Israel to learn what to do and what not to do. And as you read through the text, there are a lot of lessons here. Stay with the mediator of the covenant, right? Do not part for the grass on the other side, the green grass on the other side. Even if it's hard, even if you're suffering, even if it's a dry, arid land there where Abraham is. So you have a lesson, O Israel, what to do to persevere in suffering with the mediator of the covenant, in that case Moses, right, out in the wilderness. In the New Testament, we'll turn to these uh, to conclude. In, New, in the New Testament, 2 Peter, 2 Peter chapter 2, 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 6, the, two, the New Testament tells us this. 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 6. If by turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah to ashes... He condemned them to extinction and made them an example to those who are to, to be ungodly. And if he rescued the righteous lot, greatly distressed by the licentiousness of the wicked, for by what that righteous man saw and heard as he lived among them, he was vexed in his righteous soul day after day with their lawless deeds. So an example, it says. We were given an example, it says in verse 6. 
The same thing in Jude chapter 1 verse 7, likewise commenting the same way. And there also in Jude and in 2 Peter, interestingly, for your study of Genesis, the greater context, you have a parallel with Noah. Parallel with Noah? Well, of course, it's the same story, right? You have one family is preserved alive while the rest are destroyed with st stuff that falls down from the sky. It even continues on with a story about drunkenness and a funny event between individuals of consanguineous nature, which of course you know from the Noah story and you already had commentary on that earlier in your ICC lectures. So then what can we gather from this story? The same that ancient Israel did. And to conclude then, let's turn back to the story and look at Genesis chapter 18. Why did God do this? Why did he tell us the story? Genesis chapter 18, verse 17. The Lord said, Shall I hide from Abraham what I am about to do? Seeing that Abraham shall become a great and mighty nation, and that all the nations of the earth shall bless themselves by him? No. I have chosen him that he may charge his children and his household after him to keep the way of the Lord by doing righteousness and justice so the Lord may bring to Abraham what he has promised. And then the Lord said. Right? So the purpose of the story, the reason why it's preserved in the text for Israel is really the same reason why it's been preserved in the Judeo-Christian tradition for us today as an example, as a lesson of where sin leads, right? As Paul says in his first chapter in Romans, sin leads to death, right? We see it also in the epistle of James. That wicked man, that pagan man, turning to idols, worshiping the creature instead of the creator, whatever that creature may be, licentiousness, wealth, Whatever it might be that draws you from God, that sin will eventually lead to death. And this, of course, is the great lesson we hear throughout salvation history, a lesson not only for ancient Israel, but always applicable for the people of God throughout history. Thank you very much. Nineteen fourteen talks about how uh, Law has sons-in-laws and they were to marry his daughters. Is there any commentary on that? Would that explain the uh, the actions that followed later in uh, the next chapter? Well, it gets a little funny. It's an interesting commentary issue and manuscript issue because it says uh, that had married his daughters, and so it it's possible. And I didn't want to get into this because it was just one more, you know rabbit to chase, but um, it's possible that Lot had more children there. And that might explain the questions that Abraham was asking with the larger numbers, and then you get down to the 10. And so, um, so it's possible there's something else going on. It might be, it says, it says the two sons-in-law who had married his daughters. Does that mean there are two other daughters that Lot that got left in the, in the town and maybe some sons we don't know or something like that. It's hard to know. Uh, it's also the other question, of course, that's raised is, and well, had married, it could be betrothal language. Had married, had, were betrothed, something like that. So um, we're talking about the generalization of paganism and the sinfulness of Sodom and Gomorrah. I mean, honestly, I grew up with an understanding that Sodom and Gomorrah was punished because of the perversion of the of the sexual perversion in the area and all that stuff sure turn over to romans chapter one i think it helps clarify that romans chapter one paul says romans chapter one verse 18. romans chapter one verse 18. for the wrath of god is revealed from heaven that's not language from heaven right <laughs> uh up against all ungodliness, all ungodliness and wickedness of men who by their wickedness suppress the truth. For what can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them ever since the creation of the world, his invisible nature, 
namely his eternal power and deity, has been clearly perceived in the things that have been made. So they are without excuse, for although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him. So what is it saying there? Paul's saying, look, God created the world, and creation is a manifestation of the glory of God. And so therefore, by looking at the glory of God, looking at the creation, we should know something about the creator, right? And therefore, that's what we call natural revelation, natural revelation. And with natural revelation, therefore, comes conclusions. We call them the natural law, right? You look at nature, you exist in this natural environment, and you therefore know by looking and innately that there are certain things that are right and certain things that are wrong, right? That's called natural law, comes from natural revelation, right? And he says, so they are without excuse, whoever they are, for whatever they do, for because God has revealed the truth in natural, through natural revelation, they have natural law and therefore are culpable. He goes on to say, uh, verse 21, For although they knew God, they did not honor him, verse 21, as God or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking, and their senseless minds were darkened. Verse 22, Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man or birds or animals or reptiles. That's idolatry. Right? So they... They exchanged the glory of the immortal God for creation instead. Verse 24, Therefore God gave them up to their lusts of their hearts and to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves, because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshipped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. So what he's saying here is that the state of Sodom and Gomorrah didn't, it didn't just begin with sexual perversion, sexual licentiousness here uh, of the homosexual type. The problem in Sodom and Gomorrah, really at its root, is idolatry. You must think, idolatry? I mean, it didn't mention anything about idols there. Well, of course there were idols there, right? But really, what is the root of idolatry? Wasn't idolatry already there in Genesis chapter 3? When the woman looked at the fruit of the tree and saw in that her salvation, her joy, her end, right? That is at the root of all sin, right? Looking, turning away from God, from the Creator, from the one who cares for you and is intending for you to grow up in His image and likeness so that you can be, you can come to perfection and have fulfillment. Right? be part of his family, to turn away and look at the creature and worship that instead, to find in that your joy. And in the end, that's really what Lot was doing initially by looking at the green grass on the other side, right? Turning away and look where it ended up. Right? So in the end, all sin is idolatry, right? And as it concludes here, I'll just, just to finish, so it says, Verse 26, for this reason God gave them up to dishonorable passions. Their women exchanged natural relations for unnatural. And men likewise gave up natural relations with women and were consumed with passion for one another. Men committing shameful acts with men and receiving in their own person the due penalty for their error. And, sin, and since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up to base mind and proper conduct. They were filled with all sorts of manner of wickedness, evil, covetous, malice, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, malignity. They were gossip, sanders, haters of God, insolent, haughty, boastful, inventors of evil. It goes on and on. So the sin of idolatry, of seeing in something other than God your joy, your end, results in all sorts of sin, all sorts, a catalog of all sorts of things. One of those in part of that whole process is sexual licentiousness. Okay, so you said in the end, uh, he Lot obviously turns away from God. So how, why is he called a righteous man by Peter and why was he saved in the first place? Very good, maybe I should have been more clear my words there. Not that he necessarily turned away from God, but rather he turned away from the covenant mediator, from Abraham, right? He looked to the green grass on the other side and saw in that his comfort, his consolation, his fulfillment. But where he should have stayed was rather with Abraham and said to his herdsmen, hey, get along, right? But don't we all do that, right? I mean, isn't that part of our life? I know it's my, my life, right, of kind of getting misdirected here or there along the path occasionally and realizing, oh, I went the wrong way and come back. And so Lot is a righteous man, 
Lot tried to do the right things all the way along. Abraham did many great things, the, the great friend of God. And if you look at the narrative of Abraham, there's some, you know, some stumblings along the way. We hope you enjoyed this presentation from the Institute of Catholic Culture. If you'd like to learn more about the mission of the Institute and how you may become a part of this important work, please visit our website at www.instituteofcatholicculture.org or call us at 540-635-7155. And may the glory of Christ Church be ever more manifest upon the earth. St. John the Evangelist. Pray for us.